you've tuned in to the 49ers Rush Podcast, and here is your host, John Chapman. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the 49ers Rush Podcast. Uh, Today is kind of, this is more of a fan favorite. These are the guys that you root for, that you want to make the roster. And the 49ers, we are quite famous for always having our kind of huge camp crushes. Several people reached out on Twitter and said, can you please do an episode, since we finished with all the draft prospects, of Lorenzo Jerome, Matt Breda, and Cole Hikatini. And so we're going to break down each one of them, kind of their backgrounds, film, and what are their chances of making the roster? Are any of these undrafted free agents going to actually be a key player for the 49ers? And so it is very easy to fall in love with these guys, but please keep in mind that all 32 teams in the NFL passed on them seven times. So there are reasons why they went undrafted. We're going to discuss some of those. But these three players, and there's a big reason why everybody likes them, is because their upside is through the roof. So before we do that, I uh, just want to give a shout-out to JMan49er for, again, request for these. I really appreciate it. Put the idea in my head and decided to run with it. If you have any questions or you want something covered, we got camp coming up soon. So if you want something Just reach out on Twitter. You can get to me at JL underscore Chapman. Again, that's JL underscore C-H-A-P-M-A-N. And also launching a fantasy football podcast. So if you enjoy what I do here, teaming up with an old friend, and we um, already got five episodes out, and that is called Fantasy Football with a question mark. So thank Ron Burgundy, Fantasy Football. Um, Look us up on iTunes or Spreaker, SoundCloud. We're on all those. Again, that's Fantasy Football with a question mark. And let me know what you think. All right, let's jump into Lorenzo Jerome. So he is a safety, and he's a small school safety. He played for the the Fighting Red Flash (laughs) out of St. Francis. It's a school in Pennsylvania, a small school. Now, we got him, and we brought him in, and we gave him a zero signing bonus and zero guaranteed money, which Lorenzo Jerome was a pretty big name. And the reason why he kind of blew up on the pre-draft trail was how how much he just dominated the senior bowl. So he's a small school guy, and so everybody said, well, let's see what he can do. He's 5'10", 204. Uh, He was a high school quarterback and just one of those just, I guess, athlete isn't probably the the word to use. He just, he makes plays. He's only 5'10". He ran a 4'7", which was a big reason in his 40-yard dash, which was a big reason why he wasn't drafted. But he was a four-year starter, and he was an all-Northeast Conference pick each year, which I know it's the Northeast Conference, but it still accounts for something. Four years of production, and what he is is he's an instinctual player. And so those four years, they kind of pay off for him. Now, on film, again, he is not athletic. He is in the bottom 10% of his position in height, hand size, 40-yard dash, three cone, 20-yard shuttle, and bench press. He's just... He, he's not athletic. That's just not who he is. But he plays faster than his 40 time. I mean, he returns kicks pretty, pretty well. But his hands are always on the ball. Now, get this. He had 18 career interceptions for the fight and flash, which is just – that's that's just insane. You don't get to see those numbers very often. He played some nickel where he would press the slot guy or the number two wide receiver or even the tight end. And – He's aggressive, and he plays. He plays very, very well. You would not guess he runs a 4-7 if you watched his film. And probably the best game he ever had was in the Senior Bowl. He he brought he brought everything. And so everybody thought he was going to be a high draft pick. Not high draft pick. Third, fourth round draft pick after the Senior Bowl because they bumped him up to almost not on the radar to, oh, my gosh, you got to go get this guy because he's such a playmaker. He had two interceptions forced a fumble, a tackle for loss, and three other tackles on top of that. And again, he didn't even play the whole game. And this is an all-star game at the Senior Bowl. And he made some great plays. Now, he is a much better football player than an athlete, as I said earlier. He relies on his instincts, and that's going to pay off huge for him. So I really hope he gets a chance to get into the game because he's not going to be a guy that's going to shine in shirt and shorts. He needs to be able to get on the field. And I absolutely love the uh, the NFL made a new uh, change to how the rosters work because there used to be three cuts, but they did away with that. And they basically said you can go from, you know, your max allotment all the way down to the 53 uh, the last week of preseason. 
And so hopefully these guys, it's guys like this that are going to take advantage of that because he probably would have been the first or second cut. But he's got a shot. He's he's got a he probably has the highest percentage out of these three of making the roster, and that's just because he's at such a position with zero depth. He would play the backup free safety to Jimmy Ward. Now, so let's play this out and look at our roster construction for what the 49ers have. So the 49ers are probably just going to keep three safeties, and those three safeties, you got Jimmy Ward at free safety, you got Eric Reed at strong safety, and Jaquiski Tart at strong safety. Now, that leaves you with a giant void because Tart cannot play free safety, and you don't want him to. He's It's just not who he is. He's an in-the-box guy. So let's just say, hypothetically, Jimmy Ward goes down, and we don't have a free safety. What we'd probably do is we put Tart in at strong safety and kick Eric Reed, who has the athleticism, to play over the top. It's not what he's suited for, but he could do it in a pinch. Um, and then we would probably bring somebody like Lorenzo Jerome up from the practice squad. But he could make the roster if, for some reason, the 49ers decide, you know what? This kid could help out on kick return. We could put him in on all special teams, and it'd help us to where we don't have to double train Eric Reed at strong safety and practice him at free safety as backup. This will allow him just to focus because he switched positions a lot. I know he just played safety, but we need him to shine. This is kind of like his make it, prove it year, Eric Reed. So I'm hoping this kid makes the roster. He's a lot of fun. And easy to root for. He, again, he was a he was a high school quarterback, and they put him in at safety for one play. And sure enough, he picked his very first pass on defense, and then they just ran with it. And so that that's a big reason why he went to such a small school. One is just his size and speed. But anybody that puts up that kind of production, eighteen career interceptions, he's got a future. So hopefully, he gets a chance. He went to a smart team. Because there's no free safeties on our roster besides one. So hopefully he gets some play time. Now let's jump over to our running back. And anybody that has watched film the past three years, you absolutely love this kid. His name is Matt Breda. He's out of Georgia Southern. Ooh, you got to like that, man. You don't get a lot of Georgia Southern boys. Um, the last big guy out of Georgia Southern was Jarek McKinnon, I believe. And he was a huge speed athlete, athletic freak, very similar to Matt Breda. Now, Here's what's interesting is that we gave this kid a lot of money. We gave him a $5,000 signing bonus and $30,000 guaranteed, which is absolutely, that's gigantic. And that lets you know that he was a priority undrafted free agent for us. I would not be surprised if we talked to him and said, hey, man, we want you here. The draft didn't shake out the way we thought it would. And, you know, we, we'd love to have you here. So, Let's get into a little bit of what he brings. He is five foot nine, 195. So he is short and stocky, but his athletic prowess is just absolutely insane. So he wasn't even invited to the combine, and we'll get into that in a second for why he wasn't. But if he was, he would have been the very first running back in 40, vertical, and broad jump. And if you just look outside of that position, he would have been the top five for every single position in the entire NFL at the combine for again for a 40 yard dash, which he ran a 437, so he's lower than 44. His vertical is 42 inches. That is just insane. His broad jump 11.2. And, and so this kid, he is an athletic freak and he shows it on film. Now, a lot of people, he came on the scene in 2014, his sophomore year. Because he was a Doak Walker semifinalist for best back, basically, in the entire country. He put up 1,485 yards and 17 touchdowns his sophomore campaign. His junior year, he did better, 1,609 yards and 17 touchdowns again. But after his junior year, the entire program kind of went into a dead spin. Uh, their head coach left for Tulane. The top two quarterbacks got hurt in the first few weeks of the season. And their offense completely stalled. And his numbers dropped from that. And so whenever I say the quarterbacks got hurt and why that affected the rushing attacks, they run the triple option at Georgia Southern. So he is that first up back. He's the first option. So basically, let me try to explain the triple option. If You never see it in the NFL. But the quarterback turns to the side and fakes it to the fullback, which is what he played, even though it's not a fullback, he lines up as a fullback, straight up the A-gap, so right behind the center. And the quarterback, that's the first option. The quarterback keeps it and runs off the edge, the tackle, 
and the quarterback can keep it, which is the second option. But if they close in on the quarterback, he pitches it out to a halfback, which is the third option. So that's where the triple option comes from. And he did all the dirty work. The majority of his runs are straight up the A-gap, and he dropped big time. So in 2016, he only totaled 646 yards and three touchdowns. And so things just did not go well there. He had such a terrible senior year. He didn't get invited to the Combine, which is – it's kind of rough because people were talking about if he came out early after his junior year, he probably would have been drafted in the third or fourth round. And so he came back to try to prove that he should be a first or second round guy. It didn't go well for him and dropped all the way out of the draft. But now here's the thing. A small school competition, so you got to understand that, but he dominated against bigger schools as well. So – he, he either had 100 yards rushing or a touchdown against all of these schools, Georgia Tech twice, Georgia, Navy, Mississippi, and University of Louisiana Monroe, which isn't that big of a school, but they still get a lot of D, uh, SEC athletes that kind of fell out and stuff. So he's put up against some really good programs. Now, if you look at his game, this is, this is kind of a reach here. If you look at his game, his size and speed and athleticism – is close to, we're going way back here, and that's Steve Slayton out of West Virginia. Now, before you start chuckling, the reason why I make this comparison is simply this. Steve Slayton had one exceptional year in the NFL. He had 1,600 total yards with Houston in 2008. Now, guess who was one of the offensive coaches on that staff in 2008? None other than Kyle Shanahan, our new head coach. And so it's this absolutely perfect fit for him to be into this system. So he has – if you watch him run, it's pretty funny because his, he has those bowling ball thighs uh, similar to MJD. Now, he doesn't have the body of MJD, Maurice Jones-Drew, but he has those huge thighs that just stick out. And But once he gets going, he's a natural strider. So he has this rare combination of power through the hole – and once he opens it up, he you cannot find a clip where he is getting caught from behind by a defender because once he opens up his stride, he is gone. Now, as I said earlier, he was usually the first option in the triple option, so he's running straight up the middle. almost every, Probably about 75% of his carries are straight up the middle. And whenever he's going through the line of scrimmage, he is behind his pads, which is what you want to see. And he drives with his powerful legs, and he'll make contact. He's like a little, he's like a little pinball because he makes contact with lots of defenders, but he just bounces off and bounces through them. So it's not so much he's running people over, but it's almost like he's running blindfolded as hard as he can and just bing, 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 and then he opens it up. So there's so many missed tackles because of the power and leverage he has being so short and so explosive. Again, that 42-inch vertical just testifies to how this guy can just jump and the power he has in his legs. So inside speed, like I said, never gets caught from behind. Now, let's look at what it's going to take for this kid to make it on the roster. And I absolutely love his game. And I, I really, really hope he makes it. But he's got a huge uphill fight. Because if you look at our roster right now, we have Carlos Hyde. He, he's not going anywhere. I, I know all the reports out about how he's not a great fit for the system. The coaching staff isn't very happy for, with them, so on and so forth. That's I'm telling you right now, as soon as the games start going, that's not going to be an issue. That kid plays all out. I am so high on Carlos Hyde. I really think he's going to be great. Now, we also signed Tim Hightower, who you can say whatever you want, and I know he's old. But he is a person that you can rely on and will do exactly what you ask for him. Then you got Joe Williams, who's an absolute lock, who we traded up to get. And we even traded for Capri Bibbs. Now, the trade for Capri Bibbs, not too worried about. I don't think Capri Bibbs is actually going to make the roster. I think we took on that salary to make the trade happen. And then we also have this beast fullback, Kyle Juszczyk. So Let's look at how many people we expect to keep. In 2016, the Falcons under Shanahan, they only kept three running backs and one fullback. And almost all roster projections, I would say that you don't want to take more than three running backs. So let's look at you got Hyde, Carlos Hyde, and Joe Williams. They're locks. So that leaves a lot of people fighting for that last spot. You got Capri Bibbs, who's new. You got Tim Hightower, who's new. And now you got Matt Breda. 
And so one of those three guys is going to steal this spot. Now, what Bibbs has kind of going for him is he is that perfect third down scat back. And he's had a lot of playing time in Denver's system. Then you look at Tim Hightower. He's kind of a jack-of-all-trades, ace of none, which I think yeah, – I'd probably say Carlos Hyde is almost a king of all trades, ace of none. And then we got Breda. So we'll just have to see what happens. I don't see him carrying four running backs. It's going to be whoever can come out, hold on to the football, not fumble – during the preseason and training camp, and who can show explosive plays. Now, if we're looking for explosive plays, that's going to be Brady's game. So he's going to have to break something open to where everybody says, you know what, we have to make a spot for this guy. Having said all those things, I'd put him at about a 30% chance to make the roster, and I really do think that we will be able to – the value for running backs is so cheap. I think he is a great practice squad candidate if he does not make the roster. And if somebody gets hurt or something like that, we could bring him up later, which would probably be best for him because I don't think he's going to be ready. All right, let's move on to our last person we're going to talk about today, and that's Cole Hiccatini, the tight end out of Louisville. And he got the most money signing bonus up front. We gave him $10,000 signing bonus and $20,000 guaranteed. So he comes in as kind of the big priority guy. Which, you know, he's a hometown kid. He's from Sacramento. He uh, grew up there, and he only played one year of high school football, and that was at Pleasant Grove, the Fight Nelks. Um, but he's a big kid. He's a move tight end. He's 6'4, 247. And whenever you look at him, you don't really think a lot of athlete. If you go back and watch his pro day or any of his interviews, he's not that like jacked up athlete. That's just not who he is. He, he's not very intimidating looking. But he can jump, and he he loves to go get the ball. So he had a pretty rough route getting to the NFL because, again, he only played one year of high school football. And so from there, he went to Sacramento State and played ball, transferred there to the City College of San Fran. What's up? So he's already familiar with the city. Then Louisville picked him up for his junior and senior year. Now, his first year, he wasn't a key contributor. He had some decent numbers. But last year... He led the Louisville Cardinals in receptions with 50 touchdowns, eight, and was second in receiving yards. Now, keep in mind, Lamar Jackson won the Heisman there, and he was almost his, he was his primary target. So the kids played in a lot of big games, and he's put up some great stats. Now, he would have been drafted. He was going to be drafted. But sure enough, the last game of the year at the Citrus Bowl, he blows out his knee and had to have surgery. And... Man, you just hate whenever you hear this. It seems like more and more people are getting hurt in these bowl games, and I love bowl games, but it just sucks because it just changes the trajectory of these kids' lives. I'm not going to be shocked if we see more and more people like Leonard Fournette and McCaffrey sitting out of bowl games, especially people that have their draft stock solidified. Now, he came back, and he was only running for one week before his pro day, so he wasn't invited to the combine just because he, he couldn't do anything. And so he ran at his pro day after one week of rehab, and he ran a 4.78 and a 4.81. And this just everybody said, nope, for a move tight end, a guy that you can move around, split out wide, put in the backfield, you need more speed. But I think that he's probably closer to the low 4.7 range, maybe 4.6. But it just it's just such a bummer for this kid. But he's got a pretty good attitude about it. And if you watch the interviews and listen to him talk, he, he didn't seem to have too many regrets and, man, I, I'm rooting for this kid. He's a lot of fun to watch on film. And so I said he's a move tight end. He played off the ball most of the time. So what I mean by that is you have your center guard tackle, and usually your tight end lines up right next to your tackle with his hand on the ground. They didn't do that in Louisville. And so what they would do is he would line up a yard and a half behind the tackle, almost like a fullback but split out wide a little bit more. And a lot of the blocking scheme they would do is counter-based. So he's on the right side of the line, and he would block all the way back to the left side, and then Lamar Jackson would kind of run behind him. Now, O.J. Howard was a very similar blocking scheme at Alabama. So if you watch any of the Alabama film, it's very, very similar, almost exact same blocking scheme as that, and offense as well. Now, he excels at the jump ball, and that's kind of who he is. Think Jimmy Graham, super poor man's Jimmy Graham. Looks like a basketball player out there, but can high point it. And he has great hands. Like, he is a natural hand catcher. Sorry, yeah, natural hand catcher, which basically is the opposite 
of our current starting tight end, Vance McDonald. He doesn't let the ball get into his body and hit his shoulder pads or his stomach. He goes and attacks it, attacks the ball with his hands, and catches it as far away from his body as possible, which is what you want. Now, let's get into the negatives. He is not a special blocker. That's just, he's a get in the way type of a guy. He's not super strong. He's not very powerful, but he doesn't shy away from contact either. You're just not going to see him driving guys out of a hole or pancaking blockers. So he's the opposite of Kittle in this regard. So he can catch the ball, which Vance has had a hard time doing, and he can block, but nothing like Kittle. So. The one thing that I saw in his game film that he was the best at, and that was running a tight end option route. Uh, And what an option route is, is is very simple. You can do a number of things. So he would release from the tight end position and get about seven yards upfield to where the zone linebacker is dropping into coverage. And basically where that linebacker is, you're going to read his position and break away from him. Okay, so if he's outside – then you're going to break inside. If he's inside, you're going to break outside. If he's dropping back, you're going to sit it down and almost run a curl route. And he was spot on with this. And probably the reason why he led in receptions for Louisville is you had the quarterback, Lamar Jackson, the Heisman winner, back there dancing around as people are trying to kill him. And he would just lock on and wait for Cole Hicatini to come open because the guy could read coverage against the linebacker, which is such a mismatch. And just boom, 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 just seven, eight yards, just pop, 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 pop. And then eventually when the safeties were in single high coverage, man, he'd break one down the seam. And so he's a, he's a player. He played great in big games. My biggest pet peeve with him is anytime he doesn't catch the ball, he gets up and complains to the ref about pass interference, which just pisses me off. I hate seeing that as a competitor. You just get up, you focus on yourself. Don't focus on the other guys, but Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Now, let, let's see, what does this guy have to do, Cole Hicatini, what does he have to do to make the roster? And I'll say this, the number one thing that he has to do has nothing to do with him, it has to do with George Kittle. So what Cole Hicatini needs is for Vance McDonald to be off of this roster. He needs George Kittle to win the starting job. And I think there's probably a better than 50% chance that Kittle beats out McDonald. I really do. One, he's the new coaching staff's guy, and he's just – he's so solid to his game. And the upside is there as well. So that's number one. Number two, he's going to have to beat out Garrick Selleck and Blake Bell. Again, I don't think that's difficult. I think he'll be able to do that. Number three, prove himself on special teams. And last, number four, is he's going to have to show out on goal line situations. And I really think that if he does make our roster – I think he'd be the um, opposite wide out, split out on goal line situations opposite of Pierre Garçon. So you're up on the five-yard line, and it's third and five. Man, I'm putting Pierre Garçon on one side, Cole Hicatini 6'4", 247 on the other side, and that gives you that fade option route that's available there. And so I think he's got a shot. I'd give him a 40% chance to make the roster. And again, if I'm ranking these rookies on who's going to make the roster, I'd say number one, Lorenzo Jerome. Number two, I'm going Cole Catini. And then number three is Matt Breda. And the funny thing is Matt Breda is probably my favorite player on this. But if you just look at the depth at the position, it just seems so difficult for an undrafted guy that's so small to come in and unseat all these veterans. So... But I'm rooting for him. I want all three of these guys to make the roster. Obviously, I want a lot more than 53 to make it, but we'll see where it's at. So appreciate the listen, guys. Make sure that you hit us up on iTunes. Please go leave leave a review, whether you think it's good, great, terrible, whatever. Don't care. But I want to know what's going on. Um, I want to be able to make this podcast what you guys want. I know as a 49ers fan, I am always looking for in-depth analysis. So please hit me up on Twitter, JL underscore Chapman, and let me know what you think. You guys take care.